Hey everyone, welcome back to the Disney Movie Marathon on iHeart Movies. My name is Jonathan North, and today we're going to be finishing our mini-series on Bambi. In the first episode, my cousin Sarah and I talked about the original film, and last time my friend Christian joined me to talk about the direct-to-video sequel, Bambi 2. So if you missed either of those, be sure to check them out before we get to this one. In this episode, we're going to be talking about another Disney adaptation of a Felix Salton book, this one about a different creature of the forest, Perry, which follows the life of a squirrel. And this is not your ordinary Disney movie, it's actually one of Disney's True Life Adventures, which were a series of nature documentaries that Disney produced between 1948 and 1960. If you're familiar with their current Disney nature films, the True Life Adventures were kind of the ancestor to that series. So for those of you wondering why we're talking about this obscure movie that you've likely never heard of alongside Bambi, it's partly because this was based very loosely on a book by the same author of the original Bambi novel, Felix Salton, but it actually even contains a cameo by Bambi himself. And somehow, in all our discussion, we actually even forgot to mention that point, so let me just do that now. Yes, Bambi actually makes a cameo in this movie, in live-action form. So, Disney, you don't need to do a live-action Bambi adaptation. Walt himself beat you to it 63 years ago. I don't think they care. Anyway, there's a real-life deer in this movie, and I'm not sure if it's because they caught one on film and decided just to call him Bambi, or if they set out to find a deer for the story. Either way, from what I've read, Bambi actually does make a cameo in the original book anyway, so it's totally fitting that they worked him into this movie adaptation as well. And that gives me a great idea. The Disney Felix Salton Cinematic Universe. After they remake Bambi, they could do Perry, and then they could do the sequel to Bambi, Bambi's Children, the sequel by Felix Salton, not Bambi 2, and then they could just keep going. There's plenty of depressing Felix Salton nature stories for them to choose from. I mean, I'd watch them. If for no other reason to see if Disney dares to go as dark as Salton himself. Anyway, I suppose we better get on to the actual episode. So let's talk about Disney's Perry with Sarah on iHeart Movies. Okay, so we're talking about another book by Felix Salton called Perry. The author of Bambi. Yes. This one is about a squirrel. I have never read this book, but I know from reading the Wikipedia page that there are some significant differences, and I could already tell that while we were watching it, because the Perry movie is basically, if you've ever seen any of the Disney documentaries from around that time, it's just basically a nature documentary, but they just incorporated some very basic elements of the story of Perry so that they could call it an adaptation of Perry. But it is far more of a documentary than it is an adaptation of Perry. Especially because, and before we even get into the movie, I'm just going to talk about at least the biggest difference between the movie and the book is the fact that, according to the Wikipedia page, the story begins with a human child saving Perry's mother from a Martin. Mm. And in the movie, you have this whole thing with the father watching over Perry's family and sacrificing himself to the Martin so that his family can survive. And, like I said, I have not read this book but from what I've read on the internet, it does not say this on the Wikipedia page, but it sounds like, at least at the beginning, Perry can actually talk to this human child. Like, she's young, uh, like they make it sound like she's young enough that she hasn't, I guess, like forgotten how to talk to animals. As if you know that as a child. <laughs> it, it's, it seems like... At least Perry, the book, is a lot more of a fantasy right. than the movie. Right. And the movie does have some elements of fantasy, which we'll get into a little later. But at least in that regard, with the human child thing, it sounds like... Far more of a storybook. Yeah. But at least from the things that I can gather, it's still similar. Maybe, I don't know if it's quite as dark as Bambi, but there's some dark stuff in it anyways, because... Nature is dark and brutal, according to Felix Salton. And technically, yes, in real life, nature is dark and brutal, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. And and they have that mixture in yeah. this. Yeah, definitely. So anyway, it starts out with the scene, it, mainly with what, well, it starts out with a song, which... I loved. Yeah. It starts out, and, and the film is very 50s, 
beautiful landscape, beautiful choir music, wonderful lyrics. Like, I would learn this song, but that's me. And right away, I'm already starting to like what I'm seeing. I, when he brought up watching something to do with Felix Salton, I'm like, ah, you, you just don't know what you're getting into. I don't know how apprehensive I was. I was probably more apprehensive about Bambi, but this was really neat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a movie that I saw when I was a kid. I probably saw it multiple times. My Uncle Dan, and maybe I've mentioned this on other podcasts before, but my Uncle Dan would tape the Disney Channel. Like, he'd stick in a VHS tape, which they were like six hours long. Like, he'd do that before he went to bed, and he'd just hit record, and then he'd give me whatever taped in the middle of the night. And it's Disney Channel, so that's... That's okay. That's safe. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't trying to be weird. <laughs> so I got a lot of random old Disney movies back then. And that period of time, like their p- programming block was called Vault Disney, which we know about the Disney Vault. It's their mythical vault where they lock old films, which I think is going away now since they're putting out Disney+. Plus. I think all films will be available all the time, hopefully. But anyways, that was what they called this programming block, was Vault Disney, and all they would play is old movies from, like, 40s through the 80s. Like, anything that was, like, before that time, like, I think that was late 90s. At a time of the day when all the little children are in bed. (laughs) Yeah. But he taped it for me, so I got to see it. And I never watched this. I never remember seeing this, but I'm glad that I got to see it now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one that, because there would be, once in a while, there would be a movie that I would bring over and watch with my cousins, but this wasn't one of them, but I remember watching it multiple times on my own. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was one of my favorites, but I liked it because it was a nature documentary, and I liked those as a kid. Probably just something to chill to. Yeah, it wasn't like... A grand epic story like, oh, this is the best movie. i got to share this with everybody. But I liked it. So that's how I knew about this movie. Otherwise, I would have no idea this exists. And I'm going to guess that anybody listening to this probably has no idea it exists either. Unless you were randomly searching Perry and this now comes up in the Google search because I put it out there. But like of my regular audience, you're probably not going to know what Perry is. This whole thing is live action with a narrator and Mm -hmm. you discovered that the narrator is quite significant on this program yeah it turned out that the narrator is a guy who had done a lot of like the true life adventures that's what all the disney documentaries were called back in the day but he was also a writer at disney um i think his name was winston hibbler or maybe it's hebler it's h-i-b-l-e-r And he wrote on a lot of old movies, like from Cinderella to Alice in Wonderland, and narrated a lot of the True Life Adventures. This one he wrote and narrated for. So he was kind of significant back in the day. Quite. And not someone that people even know about today. Though I think I read that he was inducted into, like, the Disney Legends. So he's big if you know about the Disney Legends, like you read about who all has been inducted into their Hall of Fame or whatever. So he's significant in that way, but he's not a Disney legend in, like, Angela Lansbury, like somebody that everybody knows. He had a very pleasant narrator voice for this. He would have been in his 40s, so Mm -hmm. just, I don't know, kind of soothing and mature, Mm -hmm. but it has that, it has that quality of the times. One of the things that I kept noticing about the narration style is that if he could rhyme a little bit with it, mm-hmm. he liked to throw in the rhymes and make yes. it poetic. Yes, there was a lot of like the whole thing. Well, not the whole thing, but a good portion uh, a significant, was rhyming. Yeah. Which I didn't really mind. Mhm. Anyway, the story starts out with the whole introductory song and you meet Perry who at the beginning is a helpless baby squirrel. Her eyes aren't even open. She's just crawling around in her nest with her brothers and sisters. And it talks about her father living in another nest in another tree because that's, what does he say? That's the way of the forest or something like that. 
Yes, they. <laughs> Everything was in, in mentioned in like a poetic way, like the way of the forest, or and the place was called Wildwood Heart. Yes. <laughs> Which I did not remember that. That was something that really stuck out to me watching it again. I'd completely forgotten that they'd given the place that name. But it had been filmed between Utah and... Utah and Wyoming. Yes. And they shot... It says they shot 200,000 feet of film and only 8,000 were used in the finished product. Which is so understandable because they were trying to tell a more specific narrative and some of the footage they got was really neat but they probably got a lot of junk that was not Mm -hmm. relevant to what they needed wasn't good at all or couldn't be tied in with the story so they really put out a big effort to tell the story that they did Mm -hmm. and i'm sure that they Oh, they probably had to follow more than one squirrel family and just called the one squirrel yeah. Perry whenever it was convenient to do so. Also, Perry is a girl. I thought it would be a boy. I think that's kind of nice that, you know, Bambi was a boy and Perry's a girl and he just shook things up. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So you're following the squirrel family and then you're introduced to the main villain of the movie, which is a Martin. A Mama Martin. Yes, who they made sure to point out she's just doing this because she needs to feed her babies, which is true. That's yes. why anything hunts, really. Here's, here I have I have a praise and I have a complaint. Because they were very good about pointing out that these animals all need to eat. This is just the way of life out in the forest. And they did show death. They also showed tenderness they showed both aspects the thing that i didn't agree with was i think when a kill had been made at one at some point the narrator said that this that we needed to view this without emotion and i'm like just go ahead and be sad about it but realize that yes the baby martins need to eat or whoever was getting bumped Mm -hmm. off at the time yeah it's it's okay to feel emotion over things that are happening in nature but yes i think the that's creep- probably a, a really early 1900s point of view you must view this without emotion <laughs> i don't know anyway <laughs> anyway you have the the martin trying to kill perry's mother eventually you see the other the father squirrel he knows something's wrong and he runs out chattering at the martin gets the Martin to follow him, and then... The Martin wins. Yeah, Perry's father is no more. Which I don't know if that's what the squirrel had intended to have happen, but that's what happened. Yeah. And so that, there are different moments on this program that are more of the sad aspect of nature. And so if I were to watch it again, you know, I might forward through the dad squirrel getting killed. Sue me. I would rather watch all the babies frolicking than mm-hmm. than go through that again. But And then after this, you have the squirrel family moves into the father's house because their own home has been compromised. The Martin knows where it is. and There's a lot of back and forth of trying not to die on this program. Yeah. A lot more so, at least for the main character, than for the main character in Bambi. But I didn't mind it as much on this. You don't have them talking. You don't... It, Yes, it can kind of put you on on edge, like, what's going to happen? Who's going to win? But I don't feel like it scratches at your emotions the same way. It's not like the pheasant being terrified and suddenly getting murdered. It's not the same psych factor. Yeah. Yeah, it is more realistic in that way, because it really is a nature documentary. Yes. And because it's a nature documentary... There's a lot of animals in it. And I noticed, like, when I first brought up watching Perry to go along with Bambi, I remembered watching it. I remembered specific scenes, but I didn't remember a lot of the narrative. And then as we're watching that, I realized that's because there's a lot of, I guess you could call it filler, but it's it's fun to watch anyway. So there's a lot of baby it's animals. It's great filler. It's almost like... Perry is sort of important, but sort of not important. 
it's really wonderful actually because they show all of these different little families and they show they really like to pinpoint the tenderness of motherhood yeah on this and it's harder to pinpoint any real bad guy because they're mm -hmm. all just trying to survive the bobcat family oh my goodness <laughs> there's I... a family of skunks baby skunks are adorable there's a family with baby raccoons I did not expect Sarah's reaction with this. Like, when I first thought of watching this, I started watching the beginning, and it was doing that song, and I was like, oh, Sarah would like this. And I, when I got to, the, like, the Martin, I was like, oh, maybe, I don't know, maybe she'll like this. But I knew, she would, I knew she would like a lot of it. I did not expect her to, like, go into, like, a fit. I was, of, <laughs> I was geeking out. You know how you do a Google search for maybe cute baby animals? And you're scrolling through the images and all of a sudden they're like kittens and bunnies. I was smiling so much. It was like my cheeks were getting a workout. I could feel the muscles and I took probably at least a couple of pauses <laughs> in this movie just to geek out over the cuteness. There were baby foxes too. I mean, yeah, it was just so disgustingly precious oh my goodness watch it even just for the cuteness factor especially the the one scene i i thought was hilarious and adorable with the fox and the mouse like the fox is trying to catch this mouse they, and it does catch it but he's like but they're what? babies and they don't know they don't the killer instinct isn't fully developed and then the scene where the raccoon babies and the skunk babies are getting mixed up and <laughs> The moms are getting upset, and or at least the skunk mom is getting upset. They got some amazing footage mm -hmm. of, of the interaction of animals. So precious. It's worth it for that because some of these things, it's just they were blessed to get the shots that they mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Like, you're not... You can't so, you can't script this. It just happened. Yeah, and they were like, "We got to include this. This yeah. is so cool." Yeah, we'll get to that too with the with the wild with the wildfire. There was a really neat animal interaction as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you're seeing the baby animals grow up and maturing, and and I, Perry is also growing up and maturing. Yes, and then they worked it so that Perry was off kind of doing her own thing. All of a sudden there's a ruckus, and the rest of her family has gotten killed off by the Martin. She manages to escape to the other side of the creek from the Martin and set up household really near to a boy squirrel. Whose name is Poro. And they will have a future together, but for now they're just sort of neighbors. Mm-hmm. And there's a few sequences where it's following Poro doing his thing, too. The Martin tries to get across and then can't. So you see them surviving in different ways. And at some point, a wildfire occurs. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing... It kind of... I don't know if this was, if it was in the book or not. And even if it wasn't, it just feels kind of ironic that it's another wildfire in another Felix Salton story. It's very reminiscent of Bambi. Yeah. But it was such interesting footage to see the animals trying to escape and how they handled the situation. I think some of the footage anyway, like there was some, it was definitely real, but I could tell that some of it, some flames were superimposed. So I'm, I'm wondering exactly how much of it was animals escaping from the fire. There was obviously some that was, but I could tell when some smoke had been superimposed at points, and sometimes okay. flames were superimposed, like, at the bottom of the screen, just to give it a little more urgency, just to make it... Because I'm not sure that the wildfire was quite as huge as the narrative made it seem to be. It would be really hard to film. Yeah. I mean, the, you don't want to die. A lot of it would have been impossible. Like, you don't want to be filming in the middle of a raging right. forest fire. Right. You... Are taking your life into your hands, and I don't know how much I hadn't actually thought that deeply about it. There is a dream sequence somewhere in here too. I don't remember if the dream sequence happens before or after the wildfire. I would think before, because the first time that the Martin tries to get across, 
is in winter, I believe, and doesn't make it. And Perry is having winter in this other part of the forest. Mm -hmm. And I think that they just had some footage that they really wanted to use. Yeah, because it was really cool footage with the swooping snowy owls and the white minks or martins. I think it might have been a weasel with its winter coat and rabbits or hares with their winter coats. It's so just they, really cool footage. So they, they so they gave Perry a dream sequence. Yeah, it really didn't fit in with the rest of the movie. It was just kind of a weird thing, but... It's, because it's they the, could. It's one of the more memorable things. Like, we were watching and I was thinking to myself, wasn't there like a, a weird dream that happened in here somewhere? And then it started and it was like, oh yeah, she falls asleep in the winter and then they have like animated snowflakes and like the... They kind of augment the footage to include them being like born out of the snow and like the snow will poof and then the owl will appear and the weasel was adorable it was weird but cool i really like but it. sadly they ended it on sort of an ambiguous note where you're like did the weasel just get killed <laughs> by an owl so not the happiest ending to that dream <laughs> it probably was happy for perry <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, another predator gone. <laughs> now just watch out for the owl, but you'll probably be asleep then. Um, yeah. Uh. And then I believe it transitions into this wildfire, which I don't know what all they did to make that happen, but there was a particular thing within the wildfire that I thought was quite interesting. So when the squirrel is trying to get away... And goes out onto the creek and there's a bobcat on a log. Mm -hmm. And the squirrel gets up onto the bobcat's back. And at that point, the bobcat is just trying to survive. And so you have this little squirrel on top of this wild cat for I don't know how long. And it's pitiful, but incredibly precious and cute. (laughs) And at some point, the cat sort of loses control of the log and they get split up. But... But for a little while, there was peace in nature in the middle of a wildfire. Sort of, yeah. That that (laughs) kind of sums up the amount of peace that we have in nature. Peace between enemies momentarily. Yes. It was just, it was really interesting. It's another one of those things where you can't script something like that. It's just a, a really cool piece of footage that somebody caught. And it's like Perry and Poro are separated because of the fire where they were, they had been becoming a couple because it's spring and everybody's pairing up, but they make their way back to each other. It's just that the Martin is also making another attempt to mm-hmm. get across and she does. So there's this whole... Basically a chase sequence. Yes. But, but there's also a hawk as well. But Poro wasn't there yet. I think Perry was alone. So Perry's caught between a rock and a hard place between these two animals. And doesn't Poro show up and then start distracting? Yeah. And then eventually, between the Martin and, you said hawk? I I think it was a hawk. A hawk or an eagle or a bird of prey. (laughs) Going around in the trees. Like, this is kind of pitiful. The Martin and the squirrel end up down on the ground. But there's a bobcat down on the ground. And death ensues, and it's like Perry has been bereft, like they're making it come off kind of like that. Yeah. But it's like, she won't mourn for long, and then Poro emerges from like some moss or something. Mm-hmm. And they're together now, because the bobcat had taken off. The, the, the Martin. The, we, the Martin had, had died, not Poro. Not Poro. So they could be a couple, and live happily ever after in their own little squirrel way. And that's pretty much the epic journey from childhood to adolescence to young love and ensuing conflict, and finally, they are together. One thing we should probably mention, too, is at the end, there's a song. (laughs) (laughs) You mean towards the end where they are singing that really sort of gooey springtime yes well in the movie like i don't know if it's the animal whatever the 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 seasons are split up into the time of beauty the time of peace and 
together time. Now, the songs, <laughs> they have a couple of songs, one for morning, one for evening, that are really beautiful. But if you've ever seen or heard that song from Series of Unfortunate Events where they're singing about spring is the springiest time of them all, this is basically that song, yeah. only not. Yeah, it's, it really, it feels like a parody, but it's supposed to be sincere. It just, it's so almost sickeningly sweet. It's like, it's 1950s G-rated Disney. Yeah. So when the animals are pairing up, they have together time. <laughs> and and I'm, like, they didn't need to do it the way they did it, but it's okay that they didn't, like, nature documentaries today. They're, they they hold nothing back. <laughs> it's like ah uh, okay didn't need to you know they they can have that moment. I don't need to share that moment. <laughs> but, but even so, they could have held it back without giving us the song. <laughs> yeah, without without the really really. Um, it, it it's like the sugary. definition of cheese. <laughs> the definition of cheese really. I, it's a level of cheese that I can handle. I mean, you I, just get that they're trying to communicate that all of the animals are pairing up, but yeah. you get basically no scientific information at all about <laughs> no. that. This is one of the least sciencey <laughs> moments of the film. Yeah. And I don't blame them. No. They just it's... didn't want to get into, you know, this is all the kids coming to the theater. They didn't want to make it awkward, I guess. I don't know. It's fine. It's just it's super cheesy. And I I kind of I kind of expected a little more because of how good the other music was. It just seemed kind of weird that they saved the most cheesy one for the end. The other the other songs were really lovely, so I don't know what happened with this one, <laughs> but it's but it, fine. It, it it's was not okay. bad. It's just kind of it okay. weird. Yeah, I like the squirrels. At some point, they boop noses, and I said, "Well, they kiss, so they're married now." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's that level, yeah. which which is which is fine, but but basically, but, after the together time song. They're together. They're a couple. That's like the happy. No, ending. I think that the together song happened earlier before the wildfire, because it was like they were starting to pair up, and it was interrupted by this dreadful sequence of events, and then they were together. Oh, maybe. Yeah. So really, they we act- watched this like three days ago. We should remember it better than this. <laughs> I I think that's how it happened, though. Probably. And, um. There's a decent amount of death and disturbance in this but there's also beauty and artistry and poetry mm-hmm. and a boatload of adorableness so i definitely recommend this just as long as you're okay with stomaching a little bit of the sad side of nature it has good drama it's a good it's a good story it's really well done and i'm assuming that it's a lot lighter than the book. Just because my experience with Bambi anyway. I don't I, know. I, 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 believe... I just feel like you don't get as emotionally um as emotionally involved in a in a because they're not speaking English to you, you don't have the same mm-hmm. since it's told from a narrative perspective yeah. with nature footage. And I and they do talk in the book from what I can tell. Like, I, I think it has, from what I can tell, it ends similarly in that Poro and Perry are together, and as far as I know, they do not die. It was the way, was the way they include all of these other animals and show the perspective of everybody mm-hmm. trying to survive, you, you just don't get the same horror show <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know how much of a horror show the book is but at, at least oh as i'm far just as... i'm just like comparing the feelings that you have between can get between bambi and between this i just don't feel like you mm-hmm. get as emotional especially since they're cutting out and looking in, at all this other footage so it's not just fixated on will perry make it mm-hmm. i think it creates a lighter a lighter experience mm-hmm I would watch it again, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would too. recommend if you like vintage stuff, 
and nature documentaries and adorable baby animals. Definitely recommend. Okay. Thanks again to Sarah for joining me on this episode. If you're interested in checking out Perry for yourself, it's actually available on Disney+. Plus, and it wasn't when we recorded this last year. This was actually a movie I'd only seen on a homemade VHS taped off the Disney Channel. And once VCRs became obsolete, I had no way of watching it again for years. And I probably don't even have that tape anymore. Anyway, when I decided I really wanted to talk about this movie on the podcast, I had to scour the back alleys of the internet for days last summer looking for it. As you might imagine, an obscure documentary about a squirrel from 1957 is not really that easy to find. But now, thanks to Disney+, Plus, we have most of the Disney library at our fingertips. I wish I'd had it last summer. It would have saved me so much time. Anyway, that's over. In the future, I will be able to solely rely on the magic of Disney+, Plus for this series. And I say that very sarcastically because I have episodes coming up about victory through air power, make my music, and even... <clears throat> Song of the South! None of which are available on Disney+. Plus. Oh well, I will cross all of those bridges when I come to them. Anyway, next time I will have a brand new guest on the podcast. Stephen Manasseh will be joining me, and we're going to be talking about The Dark Crystal, both the original 1988 film as well as the new Netflix series from last year. We talked for a long time on those, so I'm pretty sure that's going to end up being two episodes. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the iHeart Podcast. Podcast.